Good morning, everyone. Day two, a very dense day with a full program. It's the first time, I think maybe you will correct me, Patrick, if I'm wrong. I think it's the first time that we have, uh, for the whole forum, parallel sessions. So as you already know, you will have some scientific sessions for the whole day in this auditorium. And you will, you will also have a very nice ETPN sessions in the tent talking more about translational research, let's say, and uh, also opening to other things that Pure Nano, like for instance, we have the disruptive medicine um, session by the afternoon that I strongly recommend, and also clinical application of Nano just after the coffee break. But um, first I would have to say two little things. The first one, you have extra options for very efficient networking now. Maybe some of you didn't download the B2Match application, you can still do it, so you just go on your favorite uh, application store, you download B2Match, you search by date and you will find Nanomed Europe. You, in two clicks you will be registered and we will open the place uh, for you to, to enter the forum. You can have face-to-face -face meeting, speak about some future collaborations, for instance for future H2020 um, consortia. So it's a very efficient way to build new collaborations, please use it, uh, it's indeed fully free for you. So we'll have very nicely organized biennial sessions for the face-to-face -face meetings, so download the app please. Second, we have a brokerage session, a short one, but uh, the old-fashioned ETPNY, but uh, it has proven some efficacy by the past because some of you are still participating in European projects that were born at ETPN events, in this short brokerage event. So very simple, just check the email that INL uh, sent you, I think it was on Thursday, the newsletter, and you have all the material for this brokerage. It's two or three minutes, very informal, it will be on day three. We have, uh, I think we have eight slots left for two, three minutes. It's just going on stage and say, oh, I'm willing to participate or to coordinate this call, looking for these kind of partners, I can provide this kind of expertise. It works. You will have new partners, you will be part of new H2020 projects. So please uh, go and see your, your email. If you need any help to do this brokerage, come to see me and I will help you indeed with pleasure. Um, but first, we have a new keynote this morning. I'm very happy to uh, welcome Jennifer Gossman. Uh, today on stage, please Jennifer, if you may come. Um, Jennifer, I would say, is a very good friend of the ETPN for many reasons. Now she works at the NIH. She's a great specialist of nano against infectious disease. But she uh, used to run the, well, to, to, to be in the management of the uh, NCI, NCL. And I think uh, it's very, very impressive the collaboration we had before between the NCI, NCL and the EU, NCL. I think it's quite unique the um, excellent relationship we had and all the expertise sharing we could have so now the NCL has saved some years of experience. Now, So now you move to a new position mm -hmm. and Jennifer it's our great pleasure to welcome you for a keynote on stage. Thank you very much for being part of NME19. Thank you so much Alex. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, my name is Jennifer Grossman. I'm a senior scientific program manager now in the National Institute for Allergies and Infectious Diseases at the NIH in the US. Um, and I've only been there since November of last year. And before that, I was at the NCL working in cancer nanotech. And so since I've only been at NIAD working in infectious diseases um, for about seven months, I'm not gonna give you an overview of all of the ways that nanomedicine is being used for infectious disease. I'm gonna talk a little bit about my story and about what it's like to come from a nanomedicine for cancer background into a nanomedicine for infectious disease background and the things I've learned and what I think is neat and what I think is promising going forward. I have to disclaim the views are my own. They're not representative of the views of the NIH or NIAD or NCI. This is kind of an outline of my talk. I'm gonna start with my perspective and where I'm coming from, and then talk about uh, some of the ways that nanomedicine is being used in interesting ways, uh, 
with a focus on HIV. I'm in the division of AIDS and HIV vaccines, uh, but also uh, some interesting work from NIAID's Vaccine Research Center, which produces vaccines for a host of diseases like Ebola, um, a flu vaccine, um, all kinds of uh, vaccine products. I'm going to talk about uh, the ways that nanoparticles can be used to display antigens on their surface and why that is sort of the state of the art in vaccine design right now. I'm going to talk about RNA and nucleic acid platforms, and which are also a, a very promising area of vaccine research. I'm going to talk about some of the adjuvant effects that nanoparticles have and our attempts to understand that and where it comes from and utilize it and the potential for delivery to immune cells and nanoparticles as little decoys of viruses. Uh, and then I'll get into some of the product development and manufacturing aspects of nanomedicine for vaccines. So my story, my perspective, for 11 years, I was part of the Nanotechnology Characterization Lab, the NCL, which is in Frederick, Maryland, and supports the NCI Alliance for Nanotechnology and Cancer. We take in nanomaterials from industry and academia and provide an independent testing laboratory that provides the results back to the investigator. So I had, while I was at NCL, we tested more than 400 different nanomaterial cancer products. We have an assay cascade that consisted of physical chemical characterization, in vitro testing, in vivo testing, uh, and we had 14 products that we had tested that got into clinical trials and three that went on the market. And uh, I loved it there. It was a great place to work and it was, it was uh, I felt like I had a unique perspective on what was being developed in nanomedicine. Um, for cancer. Uh, we worked with some nanomedicines for other products, but the fo since we were funded by the NCI, our focus was very much on cancer products. And as cancer research transitioned towards more immunotherapy approaches, uh, the effects on the immune system got more important, and we started testing in the NCL some cancer vaccines. And in 2017, I went to a conference at NIAD um, in the Division of AIDS, um, which was the second nanotechnology workshop for HIV, RNA, infectious diseases, and vaccine delivery. And I was excited about what I saw there because a lot of the people that were developing nanotechnology applications for HIV were the same people that we were working with at the NCL. A lot of the technologies were the same technologies, but they were being used for new applications uh, for vaccine purposes. And it seemed to me like the state of nanomedicine for HIV vaccines was like the state of nanomedicine for cancer products about five years earlier. There were a lot of really promising results, but a lot of the material was extremely poorly characterized. Nobody knew, nobody had done the testing that we did at the NCL that, to show that the products were really what they thought that they were. They hadn't characterized the identity, the purity of the product, the size of the product. And so I thought, these people, these people have great applications, but they don't know what they're doing. <laughs> They, they, um, they, they need us. They need a, a characterization lab um, to support nanotech products for HIV vaccines. Um, and so I started trying to make a collaboration with NIAID, and that led to my eventually transitioning from NCL to NIAID, and I'm still trying to build a collaboration um, with the characterization lab because it's still an area uh, where I think we need help in, in vaccine technologies. We need characterization resources um, to understand what the products are and how they interact with the immune system. My group is in the Division of AIDS, and we're called the VTRB, the Vaccine Translational Research Branch. 
and we manufacture vaccine products for clinical trials uh, that are done through what's called the HVTN, the HIV Vaccine Translational Research Network, which has 75 ongoing clinical trials of vaccine products, which I was shocked to learn at the time. I mean, 75 HIV vaccine clinical trials seemed like a lot of HIV vaccine trials. Um, and and it's a, it's a huge network, both in the United States and Europe and Africa, uh, conducting these clinical trials of experimental products. And the VTRB doesn't provide all of the products for those trials, but it provides uh, many of them, uh, probably the majority of the products. And this is a schematic that I made showing the kinds of products that we make at the Vaccine Translational Research Program. So there are proteins, the HIV virus gets into cells using a glycopeptide protein on its surface, and that protein is a trimeric protein that uh, we make recombinantly, and we make very many different versions of that protein and manufacture them GMP to start clinical trials. That protein, when it's administered by itself, turns out to not be very immunogenic, and so it needs to be stabilized, and we work on a variety of ways to stabilize that, some of which are using nanoparticles, and I'll show you those. If, um, we also make a variety of nanoparticle products as well as DNA and RNA vaccine products, which frequently involve some sort of nanotech encapsulation. We make adjuvants. Um, alum is tra a traditional adjuvant. There's also nano alum, and there are liposomal products that have adjuvant effects. Monoclonal antibodies that have properties for protection against HIV and viral vector vaccines, which are sort of a traditional way of delivering vaccine products. In terms of nanoparticle delivery for HIV, these are some of the HIV immunogens that are state of the art for HIV, um, but uh, probably not familiar, certainly weren't familiar to me coming from a cancer uh, background, uh, but that right now in the VTRB we're stabilizing by putting on nanoparticles and delivering by nanoparticle uh, technologies. And they have different, the nanoparticle has a different concept for each of these. Sometimes it, the nanoparticle helps engage antibody responses. Sometimes the nanoparticle helps engage um, uh, CD4 cells. Sometimes the nanoparticle helps with delivery to the lymph nodes. Um, frequently, the nanoparticle helps by st stabilizing the the antigen on the surface and providing it to the immune system in a way that causes the immune system to recognize it. The trimer protein is, in, in, the, in the actual virus, the trimer protein is on the surface uh, of what is essentially a nanoparticle. And that presentation can help activate the immune system and generate a stronger response. Each of these has, has a different type of nanomaterial. Different types of nanomaterials are being used for vaccine delivery. Um, our N332 immunogen is delivered by a ferritin nanoparticle, which is on the small side. There are also polymeric nanoparticles that are being used, as well as self-assembling protein particles, lipid nanoparticles, and um, and liposomes that are serving as the platform to deliver these vaccine products. So it's all the same type of platforms that we use in cancer development that are being used for 
HIV vaccines. And that was part of what got me excited about working in infectious diseases when I was still at NCI, because there was so, there was such a large body of knowledge that had been gained uh, testing cancer products that I felt like could be applied to nanoparticle HIV vaccine products. But that was just the beginning. And it, it's a it's a method it's a uh, a lesson that we had learned at NCL and that we preached at NCL that no one particle fits all. That's true for cancer as well as for vaccine products. That uh, different platforms serve different purposes and have different properties. And uh, there's there's no one answer to the nanotech delivery problem question. Um, some of the interesting products that I've started working with since I got to NIAD um, uh, are come from small companies. Uh, both of these are in the United States, but uh, through the SBIR program, the Small Business Innovation Research Grants, um, I work with a company called Pop Biotechnologies that is developing a liposome platform. Uh, for delivery of HIV trimers. So in this case, they take liposomes and mix with a particular type of HIV trimer. Um, this is called an NFL trimer, which stands for Native Flexible Linker. Um, the, the PI has developed a particular linker that allows the trimer protein antigen to be stabilized on the surface of a nanoparticle in a particular conformation that we think, we don't know, is efficacious for HIV vaccines. And so they produce liposomes, mix them with the trimers using a particular conjugation chemistry, and you can see a little bit the, the trimers stabilized on the surface of the liposome. Um, and this is, a, this is a promising vaccine candidate going um, towards development. I also work with several uh, RNA delivery systems. This one is from a company called Nanocomposix um, that has developed a silica nanoparticle for delivery of RNA. And uh, the silica particle also has TLR agonists that are designed to stimulate the immune system and support the immune response to the RNA. The RNA is RNA that encodes for the same trimeric protein that is on the surface of the uh, POP nanoparticle vaccine. Uh, but a completely different technology because now you're just delivering the RNA for the trimer, for the antigen, not delivering the antigen itself, the protein itself. And so completely different manufacturing, completely different testing that is necessary for that type of technology. Another promising uh, application of nanotechnology is in antigen display. So it's, it's for cancer too, it was always the argument that um, one of the benefits of nanotechnology was that you could ex display several different drugs uh, on the surface of a molecule. This is a protein nanoparticle that's being used as a candidate uh, HIV, I'm, I'm sorry, a flu vaccine. It's a, it's a candidate universal flu vaccine. What they've done, and this was produced at, at NIAD at the Vaccine Research Center. Uh, what they've done here is uh, engineer the hematoglutinin protein so that it's only the stem of the molecule. There's a stem and a hypervariable region, and they've taken the protein and done several different mutations so that they actually get rid of the head part of the protein, which is the typical flu response. The benefit of that is that the stem is common across many different HIV vaccines. So night the uh, flu vaccines. The, the flu vaccine mutates every year and one of the problems with it is that, uh, one of the problems with treating it is that it, it changes. But it turns out what changes is the head of that molecule, not the stem. The stem is common across 90 years of flu vaccines, but the stem given by itself is not particularly immunogenic. 
So if you attach it to a nanoparticle and have a multivalent display, you increase the immunogenicity of that stem and start to produce antibodies in the body against the stem, um, which is common, and you, you have something that, in animals at least, looks like a promising candidate universal flu vaccine. It can be used to treat all the variations of the flu. And they've shown with this um, in, in mice that it can treat flu strains that they've isolated over a period of 90 years. So it's, it's, it's a, a promising universal flu vaccine. Another nanotech, uh, attempt also by NIAD at a universal flu vaccine involves co-display of different binding domains, uh, for the flu antigen on the surface so that you, when an antibody uh, responds to the nanoparticle, it's responding to different parts of the molecule. And this has advantages uh, and produces a broader antibody response than just a mixture of the nanoparticle with all the same uh, antigen on the surface. A second, and I'm only going to talk about two, but a second really promising area of vaccine research are RNA vaccine platforms, uh, specifically mRNA. The, the goal here and why it's exciting is that delivering RNA gives you quite a bit of flexibility because RNA is relatively homogeneous. One RNA strain has close to the same properties as another RNA strand. You can envision manufacturing processes where the RNA could be changed out in a plug and play fashion. And so we could treat vaccine, we could treat diseases as they evolve. It's one of the problems with infectious disease that it's always changing, that we're always fighting a new uh, version of a virus. And so if we could produce vaccines that also evolved, if we could test what is the current uh, flu virus or the current um, form of a virus and then create an RNA that we knew was effective against that strain, we could always be changing the production to match the current disease. And uh, that's not possible with protein-based vaccines, but it's potentially possible with an RNA vaccine. And they're also safe, um, unlike plasma DNA vaccines, which are another protein vaccines, plasma DNA and RNA. Um, mRNA vaccines uh, are, are safe. Um, uh, you have no concerns related to viral contamination or infectiousness. Um, they're also... Uh, it's a simpler route than DNA vaccines since you don't have to get to the nucleus. It's translated in the cytosol. So um, that, that has advantages in terms of presentation uh, to T cells. Um, and the anti antigens can be engineered to be secreted uh, if effectively. And it has advantages related to developability and manufacturing. And like I said, being able to change the manufacturing to match the disease. We did a survey of all of the types of RNA vaccines that are being developed in industry. Um, uh, this is a few months old now, but uh, still relatively um, current. And what I thought was interesting about this was that the products, um, these, are, these are all lipid nanoparticles delivery of mRNA um, from the literature. And what I thought was interesting was that many um, of the lipid nanoparticle compositions are relatively similar across all of them that are being developed, which is something I had suspected from my work at the Nanotech Characterization Lab, where we had also characterized uh, mRNA delivery systems. Um, we had tested them from different producers and they all, everyone has their proprietary delivery system, but they all kind of look the same. Um, and then looking at them across the literature, the ratios of the 
ionizable lipid to the helper lipid to the cholesterol, if you take the ratios for all of these, they're all relatively close to each other. There are very few outliers, even though they're all extremely proprietary lipid nanoparticle delivery systems, there's not a lot of variation in the formulation that you can see here. Um, so, um, uh, many companies are, are interested in developing RNA vaccine products, just like many companies are developing m mRNA delivery for other diseases. The testing for these products uh, is a different set of testing than for a protein vaccine. This is a, a table of the analytical testing that's required for GMP manufacture of an RNA lipid nanoparticle uh, drug product. And for any type of drug product, you test the potency, the purity, the identity, and the safety, and the quality. But the way you do those tests vary from product to product. And for an RNA system, you usually test the potency by in vitro transfection. You want to see that your mRNA is delivered into cells and produces the uh, protein that it's supposed to. You test uh, for the individual lipid concentrations, the, uh, the purity of the RNA using a specific assay for that purpose, the quality of the RNA, the concentration of the RNA, as well as the, um, the properties of the nanoparticle. So the size, the zeta potential, the morphology by electron microscopy, all of these are important components of a testing program for an RNA vaccine. Um, and it really is a completely different set of testing than for a protein-based vaccine. Um, so when you're just developing a protein, which is just a biological product, you don't have the same set of tests. You don't necessarily look at an antibody by electron microscopy. But for a lipid nanoparticle RNA system, it's very interesting to look at it that way. One of the, the first things that interested me when I, when I before I came to NIAD, um, was that the HIV virus looks like a nanoparticle. I had seen, working at NCI, I had seen lots of electron micrographs of lipid nanoparticles delivering DNA or RNA. Um, and this is a picture of the HIV virus entering a cell. Um, this is the virus. And this is the scale bar. It's about 100 nanometers in size. And so the, the HIV virus really, to me, looks like a little, it, it, has, an it has a lipid envelope coating with uh, a display of different proteins on the surface. And that is something that we can engineer um, and make a nanoparticle that looks in a similar fashion um, and potentially looks in a similar fashion to the immune system, which is what you want in a vaccine. You want it to look like the virus um, and potentially have the same adjuvant effects as the virus. If we use similar proteins that are found in the virus, in the lipid nanoparticle, if we, we can create the same adjuvant effects, the same pathogen-associated molecular patterns, they call them PAMPs, or damage-associated molecular patterns, DAMPs, that the virus creates, which may be important in stimulating the immune system to respond to the vaccine. It's not just HIV that looks like a little nanoparticle, it's all, <laughs> it's not all of the viruses. Ebola doesn't look anything like a little nanoparticle, but herpes, hepatitis, influenza, these are all electron micrographs, they all ha share that property. And so I, I think it's a promising area that we could engineer nanoparticles that serve as decoys, um, stimulate the immune system without uh, infecting the body and produce an immune response. So just to recap, um, these were the important 
points or the interesting points that I have seen so far at NIAD. I am uh, looking forward to using the technologies that we tested at NCI and, and the technologies that have been developed for cancer research to continue to uh, push the envelope of what's being done for uh, HIV as well as other types of infectious diseases. And I think it's a, a promising area uh, for the use of these technologies and one that doesn't get as much attention as what's being done in cancer nanomedicine. Um, so if you're working in infectious diseases, nanomedicine for infectious diseases, I will want to talk to you. So please come up and say hello and tell me about your work because I am still coming up to speed and trying to learn about what's out there in terms of nanomedicine and to bring it in to NIAID to manufacture and create vaccines uh, that can be used to help treat pandemics. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jennifer, that was brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, we have time for some quick questions. Do you have any? Thank you very much, Alex. Is it? Okay. Uh, I have a short question. You mentioned that for RNA, it's uh, in vitro transfection that is the, the characterization way for the potency. But do you have any ideas on the correlation between these in vitro results and then later on in vivo and in human? How relevant are those results really? It, it's a great question. And we use that in vitro test as a release assay because it's not practical to use an in vivo test as part of a, a release assay for a GMP manufacturing run. But it's a great question how the in vitro transfection results relate to in vivo. And those experiments always have to be done uh, if you can. And, and for um, the HIV product that we're working with, we did do an in vivo study to look at the expression, uh, essentially uh, a, a distribution study. In addition to testing the in vitro transfection, looking at the distribution uh, in animals, which, which can be different. You, you never know exactly how th the results in vitro relate to the results in vivo. Um, but, but for a release test, in vitro is the best we've got. Other question? Yes? Okay, uh, I, I must say, I think that the biggest problem there are the adjuvants. I mean, my uh, experience is the, um, traditionally the adjuvants are a dog's dinner. So uh, there is everything, soluble, uh, microparticles, nanoparticles, uh, dynamic systems, and so on. So, uh, and uh, we don't know actually how they act in co-formulation. Do they stick or not? To, uh, now, I have a, que a design question. Should you have the possibility to design the uh, uh, nano formulation of your choice? Would you stick the adjuvant in the same object as the antigen or not? So, uh, I completely agree with you with adjuvants being a mess um, and, and was it's one of the frustrating but exciting uh, things about starting to work with vaccines is that what causes the ad adjuvant effects is completely unknown. Um, alum, which is the, the gold standard, which is the aluminum standard for uh, adjuvant uh, use and and one of the only uh, adjuvants that's approved for use in humans. There are there are new ones, but um, certainly the best understood is super poorly understood and super poorly characterized. Uh, it's it's a mess. I am currently working on a GMP fill of of alum, and and the testing of the product uh, reveals that that it's it's a complex mixture and we don't understand it. And uh, we're, we're doing studies at NIAID uh, right now to try and understand better the effects of alum adjuvants as well as liposomal adjuvants. So we've taken, since we're in the Division of AIDS, we've taken uh, several different promising HIV trimer antigens and, mix, and are mixing them with 
different versions of alum because there are, I think, four different versions of alum that are available out there. There's rehydrogel, there's um, adufos, there, there are four different uh, flavors of alum. And testing the different alums and looking at uh, the effect on antigen binding. But no one knows that the effect on antigen binding to an adjuvant is really a good metric for the adjuvanticity uh, effect. So you, you have to, in addition to looking at binding and the effects of, on the antigen, you have to do an, an entire in vivo study to see if you're getting increased immunogenicity because you're getting tighter binding. Or it can be the opposite. In some cases, it's an opposite effect. Uh, so I think that it's something that has to be explored. Uh, we are trying both methods that you mentioned. So we are trying, uh, in, in the Division of AIDS at VTRB, we are ma manufacturing some antigens that are intended to be bound directly to an adjuvant and some that are uh, co-administered and um, almost none that are not adjuvanted at all because it turns out that doesn't seem to work ever and you can't do a clinical trial if you don't expect a benefit. We have time for last question, so who will it be? There are two raised hands. Three? Oh, okay. She had the mic. No, Chantal, okay. go ahead. Uh, thank you so much for our overview. I actually have a comment just um, back to the question from Ruth uh, Schmidt. Uh, I think uh, there, is a, there is no correlation really between what we are doing in vitro, especially for dendritic cells, and when you are going back to the in vivo. And it's really a matter of which type of administrations you are going to do. This is our, our experience in my lab. Um, but um, you need to do the in vitro test just to make sure that your messenger RNA is really working and at least your delivery systems are not toxic. This is one of the first uh, things. And the second uh, part is, uh, comment I would like to, 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 to ask you is, I think the, um, the messenger RNA field allows us to use messenger RNA that are code for immunostimulants. So in this way, you can make a co-combination of different types of molecules, avoiding actually the question of which type of adjuvant I have to use, which type of, maybe it could help a little bit more, but again, as I said, it will depend on the type of vaccine, of viruses, of bacteria, of infectious of mRNA, pathogens, or, or yeah. messenger RNA are using. Yeah. Uh, it's really, yeah. I, I, I think that's a great comment. Um, I, I, the, the second part of it especially, um, I, I, um, it, it is an advantage of mRNA delivery that you can co, you can, uh, co express different molecules together. You still have to make a choice about what kind of adjuvant effects you want. You have to express uh, both of them, but uh, you, you, uh, then uh, it's, it's kind of up to the cell and up to what happens in the body um, to uh, have your adjuvant work correctly with your uh, antigen that, that when they're expressed together. Um, and that is a, a big potential advantage. Whether or not in vitro and in vivo results uh, correlate, they, you know, it, it really depends on the system and in vitro is frequently the, the best we have. Um, and I think a lot of thought has to go into what experiments you've done, how they're reflected in the in vivo reality, and an understanding of why that is the case. Um, and then you can develop a rationale um, for moving into people where it may also be completely different. Thanks. Okay, very last one. Thank you. So thank you, Jennifer, for a great talk. I, I had no idea that uh, it had advanced this much, the nano infectious diseases, in so many clinical trials already. Um, I was wondering, uh, during your time at NCI, you frequently had contacts with uh, regulators, and I was wondering, uh, um, probably you're still doing the same thing, mm -hmm. so what is the position of regulators against this, uh, this type of nano product uh, for the vaccines? Are there any, is there a position, is there a lot of uncertainty, or do they just know how to? 
deal with it? What, inform what are the information needs, etc.? So, so that's a really interesting question because I, I thought, um, so it's a different part of the FDA that we're working with. It's more um, CBER, the biologics part, does uh, all the vaccines in the United States, whereas CDER, the drug part, did most of the cancer drugs. Um, CDER does some of, uh, n not vaccine products, but like we're, I'm working on a monoclonal antibody and that one goes through CDER. Um, and uh, we had an experience recently with a uh, IND submission for a nanoparticle with a peptide on the surface of it. Um, and um, my group had worked really hard on the CMC section of the IND and providing all the data to, uh, to CBER in this case. And um, uh, NIAD, being another government agency, has kind of a friendly relationship with the FDA. And so they, they, when, they, when they see a problem in an IND submission from NIAD, they, they don't just put it on hold, <laughs> they, but they, they do call you up and they and they then they said um, that we we really think um, uh, the the package is good uh, s some things are missing um, they they liked that we had referenced the liposome guidance so there's there's a liposome guidance from the FDA and they were appreciative that we had um, we had called on that and draw, drawn attention to the fact that it was a liposome apparently uh, Apparently, there's a lot of uh, nanotech vaccine products that kind of don't self-identify as nanotech, and so they don't uh, look for guidances that are related to nanotechnology because they, they don't think of it as nanotechnology, so they, they don't look for regulatory pathways that are specific to nanotechnology. And so I think CBER, it has a, a kind of is kind of newer to the nanotechnology field and is learning along with all of us uh, how to regulate those products. And that it will, they're, they're certainly working um, with the drug side of things, but it, it's, a, it's a new uh, field. Fantastic, thanks again, Jennifer. We could have 10 more questions, but time is running, so go and see Jennifer directly. Thank you very much.